Get my setup here, so I'm gonna have my mixer here, and I'm gonna have this mixer board right here, so that way it's all easy peasy. What we're running today is the Zoom F8, and we're gonna be doing the majority of our recording through there. We're also gonna grab some tests from the H6. We're gonna rerun them with the Sennheiser EK100 Lav Packs. If you use these packs, I recommend setting the receiver to zero dB and the transmitter to negative 30 dB. I have never had an issue clipping when I have it on these settings. We're going to be using a various uh, type of Dude, I should have slept longer, I tell you. <laughs> so through those Sennheiser packs, we're going to be running the DPA 4061, Sennheiser ME2, and Countryman B6. For boom mics, we've got the Sheps uh, CMC 541, which is the same as the 641. We've got the Sheps CMIT 5U. We've got the Sennheiser 416, the Rode NTG3, and Sanken CS3E for our booms. We're gonna be doing a shootout of those as well, and we'll see what those all sound like. So now that Parker has his area picked out, what we're gonna do is go over there, listen to the acoustics, and see what we're gonna deal with and see what we can do to prevent the current reverberation that's going on throughout the whole thing. Sorry, I just, I heard sound and I just came. So the first thing that we're going to do is find where to be so we're out of the area because we don't want to be in the shot, do we? I mean, maybe. <laughs> So, the number one thing you wanna do when you get in your space, analyze the audio in the space. So I'll do this by either snapping, clacking my tongue, or even clapping. And as I'm doing this and the gaffers are like, shut up! Try and identify where your problematic sounds are coming from. It's reflecting all over here. If you, if you pretend that you're a bat, blind, like a bat, okay, and you're thinking, where is that coming from? And then you can see that it's bouncing back here. Then listen in here and it's like, okay, well our biggest problems are coming from kind of the corners and the ceilings. What are you gonna do to prevent that? We can toss in like different objects kind of around our talent. You can bring uh, sound panels, anything else. And like right now, you know, we've got a bunch of people. People help break it up. So if it were just Parker and the talent, there would be a lot more reverb in this area. That's so that's the number one I, thing you gotta That's why I brought you guys. The only reason you're here is for soundproofing. But you also want to make sure that you're not blocking lights because a lot of times people will cast boom shadow. Look at where uh, the lights are hitting. So you don't want to stick a mic where it's going to be blocking his face. So one common mistake that people make is that people always record way too far away. They record their audio on a video mic pro, like that's sitting on top of this camera. <laughs> they will say, why does the audio sound so bad? It sounds like they're 200 feet away. And it's like, because they are. Notice the distance between these two objects. I like to compare it to lenses. If you were shooting a product video with detailed macro shots, you're not gonna shoot on a 12 millimeter. If you want good close audio, you put your mic by the person. Ah! The second common mistake I see, people think they need to be right, like as physically close as possible, which is not true. When you're placing a microphone, think about it critically and say, well, if you were having a conversation with someone, where would you be? This is kind of where we'd be talking. We wouldn't be here unless, well, some, some people do, and that's fine. He's nice, bit of a close talker. A what? So what we wanna do is think kind of a natural position, right? So I like the six, eight inch up to like 12, 14 inch area. And that to me is the most natural. And that's one reason I vote for boom over love, simply because love being on your chest is in an unnatural spot. What I like to do is pretend that there's a box here. So you wanna kind of aim the microphone in that box. This is why uh, experimenting goes a long way. In theory, okay, well, yeah, this should sound good, but maybe his voice is super harsh. And so what are you gonna do to fix that? Well, you could back it off a little bit and then maybe aim a little bit like this. So we're kind of knocking that out or you could come in a little bit from the top. Natural is key. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of like set it up here. That looks good to me. You know, we've got a healthy distance. People always give me like one minute to set up. And that's like the last thing you should do. So what we're gonna do now is take a little listen. James, give me, give me a something. Test it, one, two, three. No, say something real. 
tell me what you did this morning. What did you do to get here? I went to work. So one thing that I like to do as I'm trying to grab levels is I like to um, have the person talk about things that they're naturally going to talk about. Because if you say, hey, say something, they're like, huh, what? And they have no idea, or it's like, test, 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 test. That doesn't give me an idea of how they're going to speak, especially in an interview situation. We want them to talk how they're normally going to talk. So get them to talk about something that they can keep rambling. I would kind of adjust my levels. I'd maybe move my mic around a little bit and say like, okay, where do I like this? Dial in the spot as he's talking. Almost always, they don't even know you're doing anything. Now, Brendo pointed so, this out to me. Yes. That whenever you have somebody test audio, they're always going to talk quieter in the tests, and then once you start, they're going to talk louder. Yep. 100, 95 percent. Yeah, ninety-five percent of the time, it yeah. always happens that way. So, uh, how many people are in your family? Tell me about your family. So I've got one brother, and of course my mom and dad, and uh, and then I've got uh, two daughters of my own, ages ten and six. Wow. What are you listening for? The number one thing is natural. We also want to make sure we're getting something that has the least amount of reflections going on. So in this case with a shotgun, the pattern is really sensitive and really straight. So it's going to reject a lot of this side stuff. It's going to reject, you know, like all this reflection. Stuff. And that's what I was saying earlier when, when somebody asked, well, this room sucks. It's super echoey. And I said, okay, well, yes, yeah, sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. We've done a few things like you mentioned to dampen it, but you can't change your environment. And a lot of times you can't bring in 10 blankets to surround your subject. Having a directional mic like this, that's cutting out mm -hmm. all this background noise and only focusing in on this right here, what's in front of it is going to help make it feel like there isn't as much reverb and echo going yep. on, correct? Yep. So his voice was lower. If you notice, I kind of moved it around and then tweaked the angle of it a little bit more. That's kind of where I'm aiming, 10 inches off his face. I don't want you to think, okay, so I'm gonna write that down, 10, 10 inches. inches, exactly. I want you to do what I just did, have the person talk and move the mic and listen. When you are checking levels, where are you trying to get their loudest and their lowest volumes to sit decibel level wise? Yeah, so negative six, is the peak, which is basically like if they're mumbling and then ha ha ha, that's a peak. The average, which is referred to as RMS, I like to do anywhere between negative 18 and negative 12. So right now we're hitting at six peak dB, which is like where we wanna be, but I'm gonna knock that down a little bit. Whee! It, it's way safer to record quieter because you can always boost it rather than record louder because declipping is terrible. After we get our boom set up, is I always like to have two sources of audio, a boom and a lav, because that way if one cuts out, you've got the backup, but also when you get in post, say you're cutting with a different video, then the boom, while I would prefer it like technically, it may not cut best. So then lav in that situation would be better to cut. There are multiple ways to mount a lav mic. Now there's a lot of people that ask me questions about lav mics, where to place them and what sounds best. And this is all stuff that I cover super duper in depth in my filmmakers course. General rule is it's kind of like the boom. Obviously there's no silver bullet. So what I look for is um, in the middle of the cleavage. We're gonna knock this guy in right here. Now there's a couple different ways that we can do that. We can do a triangle sandwich, which is basically getting gaff tape and then folding it like a flag and then putting it in between there. You can also use Hollywood tape which is double-sided wardrobe tape, but you wanna make sure that you have something to block the closed noise. We're going to use the Ursa mic strap. So what's nice about this is you don't have to put tape on the talent. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna run this mic in here. So one thing that people always get confused, and this applies with tape, make sure that your capsule is not covered. So it doesn't necessarily have to be out that far, but make it at least poking out because if your capsule is buried in here, it's the same thing as keeping your lens cap on. You're covering how the microphone is capturing audio, so there's no way that it can capture good audio. If you want to take a look here, this is the ME2, this is the DPA 4060, and this is the Countryman B6. So you can see that there's all super different sizes. And so when you're trying to be discreet with a lav mic, Sometimes the smallest is the best choice. My personal go-to is the DPA 4060, but again, there are different applications for all of them. So one thing with interviews, especially if they're cutting off the waist, I just toss them on the floor. And normally you don't have three packs. Another thing that I like to do if we're getting a really tighter shot, like more here, is I'll not even go inside the clothes, I'll just clip right here. So it's just right outside the shot. That way we're gonna get a lot more natural audio 
we're going to get way less clothes rustling and it's less hassle because the talent doesn't have to like put it under their shirt and one more thing to mention real quick if this was sounding bad or we didn't like it or it was bulging or it was visible we could hide it up here we could hide it in his hair think outside the box because a lot of people think if the lav can't go here you can't use it but that's not true so here's what we're doing we're gonna do a mic shootout, okay? We've got three mics on his body. We've got the Countryman B6, we've got the Sennheiser ME2, and the DPA 4061. For the shotgun slash boom microphones, we've got the Shep CMC 541, the Shep CMIT 5U, the Sankin CS3E, the Rode NTG3, Video Mic Pro Plus, and the Video Mic Go. Dude, my BO smells like freaking Fazoli's. All right, so one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. And uh, my friend and I, he will not be named, Sean, he, we were at Universal Studios uh, playing around, waiting for our custom t-shirt designs to be done, uh, being spray painted. And we decided to take quarters out of a fountain um, because we were poor. So we took quarters out of this fountain and uh, this um, large cop walked by. My friend Sean said, dude, the cops, and he booked it out. And uh, I was not fast enough. And so Sean disappeared into who knows where, and I was stuck with two pocketfuls of quarters. And the cop told me to dump them back in the fountain. And so I dumped one pocket back in and she never asked about the second pocket. And then they asked us to leave Universal Studios. And luckily it was our last day there for the week and so we were going home anyway. And so we left and I left five dollars richer and a little humiliated, but uh, came out on top nonetheless. And that has, that has how you buy your five before. And with that money, I bought two whatchamacallit bars. So one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. So one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. So one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. So one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. So one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. So one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. So one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. So one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. So one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. So one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. So one time I kicked out of Universal Studios in Florida. Uh, this was a long time ago. I was about 15. So I first want to mention that all these files will be available to download in the description so you can listen to them on your own. So as far as mics go, I want to quickly cover the lavs first. Tonally, I feel like the DPA is the closest match to a boom. For me personally, it sounds the most natural without being overly hyped. I also like that if the talent moves their head a lot, it does a good job at picking it up. So the off-axis rejection is really good. The B6 is a great mic to use with thick clothes because you can have different capsule heads on it that will give high boosts on it. This one had the medium one on there. The ME2 is an amazing mic for the price and especially being included in the Sennheiser pack. I feel like though it does not handle the talent moving their head as well as the DPA, but it still does a good job. As far as booms go, I want to first address the elephant in the room. The Rode Video Mic Go and Rode Video Mic Pro were both running into my Zoom using the Sennheiser transmitter and receiver packs that we use for the lofts. So that's why there's so much noise on the Video Mic Go. And does that make this test flawed? Well, yes, in parts, but it also brings up a super good point. And that point is RF interference. A lot of people wonder what that actually means. Well, basically, 
anything that sends and receives a signal, so your phone, Wi-Fi, wireless packs, etc., they can all cause RF interference. So while technically this makes it so we can't hear the full potential of the video mic go, because it is a decent mic, it does raise a big concern about its ability to reject RF interference. So if you don't really have a budget and you're planning on getting a camera mounted microphone, I recommend spending the extra money and getting either the Video Mic Pro or the Video Mic Pro Plus. It sounds better and it obviously rejects the RF interference. So now let's talk about the tonal quality of the booms. I personally love the Sheps microphones. They are super natural to me and feel like I'm listening to someone in the room. When you use a mic that sounds great going in, you don't need to do a lot of post work to touch it up. You just simply throw on a compressor and you're good to go. But if you're stuck with a lower end mic, then there's going to be a lot more work that you need to do to get to a good spot. Imagine if you had to go with the recording of the video mic go as is. You'd have to do massive amounts of cleanup to get out all that interference. You'd have to do e EQ, you'd have to do compression, and even then it still won't sound great. And even the higher priced VideoMic Pro to me sounds a little coney and it needs some EQ work. So to answer the question that I get all the time, which is, can I use my VideoMic Pro, my VideoMic Go, my VideoMic Pro Plus as a shotgun mic? The answer is yes, but it will need some work. But as far as the quality that the mic delivers naturally, I wouldn't call it a ready to go. Whereas the NTG3, the Sheps, and the other microphones, I feel comfortable tossing on a little bit of compression and calling it great without the need to go through some insane process of EQ and whatnot. Now, as far as noise floor, let's take a quick listen to all of the noise that these captured. So that is the amount of noise that they all pick up in the exact same position at the same volume. So you can hear that some pick up a lot more than others. And so that's something to consider when picking out a mic. Remember when we talked about the rejection of noise because of the polar pattern, AKA the way the microphone picks up the sound? Well, that all comes into play here. So if you're going to be in a super reverby room or a super noisy room, you may want to pick a different microphone. If you enjoyed this video, I highly recommend you check out my free one hour training where I talk about the top six mistakes that filmmakers are constantly making in their films and how you can stop making them and immediately improve the quality of your films. I promise you'll enjoy it. So click that link and sign up for that thing. I will see you guys on the next video. So when you turn on an audio pack, you want to push the on button. By pushing the on button, your device turns on. <laughs> if you were to push the off button, it would stay off. And if you want to learn more, check out the Filmmaker's Guide to Audio. Brought to you by, by that, that Audio, audio guy. guy. Where I teach you how to clean out rustling clothes and distortion and yelling. And we have a good time. We talk about pizza. We eat pizza. Virtually, we eat pizza. Corn dogs? This is going to provide some good clean audio for the uh, tutorial.